I think in the in the future we'll just kind of oh, say it for for YouTube. On YouTube, sorry, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you just don't quite get the same um, passing traffic. Um, so bear with me there one second. Okay, guys, um, welcome back. We tried um, just a moment ago there on the Facebook page, but we're having a few technical issues. So now we're going to stream on Facebook. Um, absolutely delighted this evening to be joined by um, Newbridge Volleyball Club's uh, Tom Landers, who'd be very well known in the Irish volleyball community for his fantastic youth development work um, and the volleyball um, activity that's that, that, that's going on down in Newbridge, both in the, the Holy Family Secondary School and, and the club itself. So Tom is here this evening and he's going to be talking to us about long-term player development, which I know is something that Tom is very, very passionate about and, and the impacts and the effects that that can have for players right through their, their volleyball career. So Tom, you are um, very welcome. How are you? Thanks, Gary. I'm good. I'm good. Ready to go. Ready to go. Good stuff. Um, so, look, tell us a little bit about long-term athlete development or long-term player development. Um, what's the history? What's the background of it? And why is it something that interests you so much? Right. So, like, the history of it is back in the 90s, Canadian called Istan Bailey was looking at athletics for Canada. And Canadians really wanted to know why their athletes in all sports weren't doing well at top level competition. So yeah. he went on to study why, and he came up with uh, this thing called long-term athlete development or that. Now, when he brought it out, it was different. He had three modules in it, training to train, training to compete and training to win. A few years after that, he realized that a fourth stage was really needed. And this is when the fundamental stage was born, when he realized this was urgent. Right, so the shortcomings he found, like if, if we want to call it the modern training system or training programs or training yeah. model, is long-term athlete development. Like before that came about, there had to be something else. And these are now called the traditional training systems. And there was lots of them. There just wasn't one the way we're trying to promote now. And what he found wrong with these traditional systems was that young athletes overcompete and undertrain. Adult training and competitions were the imposed on youngsters. If this training is good enough for adults, it's good enough for the kids. Uh, then, I suppose, not different, training competition formats for male athletes were also imposed on female athletes. Okay. Uh, the other thing that was, and I think this one is huge, like, uh, Everything in the old traditional system is geared to winning in the short term, right? Understandable, like a coach is given a job. Coaches are judged on what they win, mm. not, not on the athletes to make. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then, like, we'll just skip, like, um, fundamental skills are not taught properly so that when youngsters get to a particular stage, they still don't know the ABCs of sport or the physical literacy. The best coaches work at the elite level. Young coaches work with kids when they may not have all the experience and knowledge they need to coach the kids. Parents are not educated in or weren't educated in training principles 
and parents were a, a huge, we'll come back to them. Yeah. And the last thing he probably found out was that youngsters specialized way too early in their sport or sports. So they were the, um, the negatives in the old system. So he came up mm. with the new system. Now, in our new system, we have, um, uh, what's the, the first one? We don't do... Uh, the active start. Active start. I'll, yeah. I'll put it on the screen here, Tom, because we have, um, we kind of have the, 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 the latest iteration, I suppose, of um, the, the, the long-term athlete development kind of pathway and the, the seven different stages. Can you, can you see that there? I can indeed. So right. I, that is, yeah, go on, you, you talk us through it. Yeah, no, like just, just before I start, like what I'm talking about now is the way Newbridge approach it, the way I approach it. Okay, mm. like what I'm saying, I'm not telling people this is what they should do or this is not what they should do. I'm just saying like, this is what I do. This is what Newbridge do. In yeah. Newbridge, in Newbridge, we don't have an active start. Like it's way too young. We don't have enough coaches. Yeah. And, uh, we just don't do it. I, I think most kids now get their active start from uh, play schools and play ball and play whatever. So that's for the goal. Now, and gym, gymnastics not, will be a sport which is very much growing in participation because of this. Would that be right? It, it would. Like, if, if I was to recommend one sport to be taught in primary schools, to junior level and prime to be taught to anybody. I think every kid should go two or three go through two or three years of gymnastics. It's the yeah. basics for any sport. Kids like some parents come to me and ask me about it, and I always tell them, go put your child into gymnastics club. Even yeah. if they never do gymnastics, it will stand them for the rest of their life. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just interrupting you there, Tom. Um, on the Zoom here, you know, questions kind of can be popped into the Q and A. So Trish Summers is asking um, duh, 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 for Active Start. What, what ages are we talking about? Um, what, what ages would Active Start be? At Active Start, I would imagine like it's it's not one of my strong points, but it would go from two or three years of age up to five or six. Yeah, sure. And then you hit the fundamentals. And then you hit the fundamentals. Okay. Uh, now, like, as I'm going along, you will find that the age groups are going to overlap. Yeah. Because you can never say that a kid should move on to another cycle or another phase when they're 10 years of age or that. It doesn't happen. Uh, so, like, if we go to our fundamentals program then like we start our fundamentals program uh, at seven we take the kids on at seven and we will work through them up to 10 11 years of age and what do we do with them like i i have three things here that we do in our club and for each phase I have down what the player does or should do what the coach should do and what the game should be. Mm. To give you an idea, like in the fundamental, the player should play. You know, when kids are that young, everything they learn should be through play. Uh, there should be no strict structure or anything else that comes out in it. Everything, and it's up to the coach to make up activities that's going to give the kids the physical literacy the need as they're going on. Yeah. What is physical literacy? I do call it, people different names, the ABCs, agility, balance, balance coordination, speed. And uh, I know when I was young, uh, kids in my time learned it naturally. Maybe in your time too, Gary, I don't know, but in my time, we were, we were never indoors. 
Yeah, playing out um, in the street or in the park or climbing yeah. things, crossing rivers, everything we done. That's how we got our ABCs. That's not the case now with youngsters. So activities need to be met up that's going to copy what should be done naturally. Yeah. What's yeah. the coach's job in all of this? Like the coach at this day shouldn't be coaching. He should be guiding the kids through all the activities they need. Yeah. In in a safe and exciting way, if you want to call it that, like you know. Mm. And there should be loads of things from obstacle courses to God only knows what. If people want things, like I, I can give them ideas afterwards. Corrections, like at, at this level, like no one child to me should be taken apart and told you're doing that wrong. Mm. Yeah, like that shouldn't happen. Any correction should be really broad to the whole group. It should be sort of right, guys, we should be doing it this way, but kids shouldn't be taken out and told. You should never take a kid out anyway and tell him what he's doing wrong. So so at this stage then the purpose really is around the kids kind of learning about their own bodies and their own movements and how to move and you know take yeah, in like that, yeah. Like within our club, like and this may seem strange to people, but like we would have eight, nine year olds, and like if if any or Barney or anybody from our club is listening, they can second this like we still have kids that can't run properly mm. they can't catch a ball and they can't throw a ball and this is yeah. like from nine years of age so like not all kids are able to do things naturally and it is the coach's job to help them achieve that like so the game at this stage is all fun no matter what it is, like what do we do with them? We bring in a game that I love. I think it's, I copied it from the Dutch. Catch and throw, I think is the best game that was ever invented for young kids. Teaches them everything. So tell us about that, Tom. How does, how does that work? Give us a brief kind of overview of, of how catch and throw works. A brief, a, a brief thing, it can be done one and I, I won't say one against one, I'll say one with one, two with two, because mm. like all games when they're taught initially, it should never be a competition. Mm. Because if, if I'm playing with you, Gary, and like we are seven or eight years old, and if, I, if you're told the objective is to keep catching me out, like you'll keep going to keep throwing the ball away from me. I'm going to keep throwing the ball away from you. Uh, we're never going to learn how to catch a ball properly. We're never going to do things. So all things should be started. I'm throwing a ball to you. You're throwing a ball to me. And when we have that going right, now we can play a game where I'm going to try and catch you or you're going to try and catch me. Yeah. Then we can go to two versus two or three versus three. And it's simple how it works. It's that um, I start the game, I throw the ball over the net to your team. When I do that, my team must rotate. You catch the ball and you throw it back, your team must rotate. What does that do? Uh, it, it teaches, first of, first of all, obviously, the kids to throw the ball over. I teach them to throw it over fast. It teaches the kids on the court, they have to move fast before the ball comes back. Yeah. Yeah. And this builds up the whole way up to 10, 11 years of age. And in fact, like, I, I don't mind saying it, like in the secondary school in Newbridge, uh, senior search students love playing it. Yeah. There's no, no great skill required and not, don't have to do anything. And they see it as a great way of relaxing and being de-stressed. Well, every, everyone touches the ball. That's the thing yeah. as well. Everyone's involved. Um, 
and you can see that it's fun. Like I, even adults now, you, you just want to be involved in a game when you're playing it. You know, you want to you want to play a role and you want you want to play a part. And the, the, the last thing then I'll say about this program is that like kids at this age, like they should be putting in about twelve hours a week exercise, and people will say, "Oh, no, kids do that." Like. Mm. To me, kids put in far more than that. If you watch them at school, they'll do maybe an hour during the day at school. When they come home, they're going to go out, they're going to kick a ball. Or Like, I know with our club, kids come to us and then they're gone from hours, they're going to the soccer or they're going to the or they're going someplace else. So yeah. most kids at that age, trust me, are doing, they don't need to... To be looking saying you're not doing your 12 hours or you're not doing whatever you should be doing and 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 this 12 hours or whatever this is part of the long-term athlete development yeah so okay. if, if if nobody has questions we'll move on to our next one learning to train and this goes from roughly 10 to 13 maybe 11 to 14, depending on the kids and where to go. I, I, I think at this stage, coaches need to be aware that sometimes kids go around in groups mm. and you need to, to be very careful if you're moving a kid from one phase to another or you're leaving a kid behind and you're moving up their friends how it's going to affect the different kids. Yeah, sure. Like that's some coaches need to be aware of that. There is a thing there. Sometimes kids come to training in groups because they like each other's company. And yeah. one of them says, let's go to volleyball. And they all go to volleyball. And then suddenly if they're split up at volleyball, they don't like it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just need to be aware. So like within our club then at this stage, as I said, we have the player, the coach, and we have the game. And the player at, at this level, like we allow players to explore the game, if you want to call it that. Do new things, doing different things, uh, new experiences. It's a different game. They haven't done a lot of this before. And the thing is, let them go off out there and do it. And uh, I wouldn't be too structured with them. Like kids are there to enjoy themselves. Uh, yeah. they, they should be enjoying themselves. And at this stage, then, like, the coach should be teaching. Right? Kids have a little bit more concentration. They can listen a little bit longer. Instead of listening to you for 10 seconds, they might listen to you for 30 seconds or 40 seconds. So you can tell them a little bit more. Yeah. And, uh, that's where, and the game then that we recommend for this is mini volleyball. Go on, now, tell us about mini volleyball and how does that work? Now, the mini volleyball is three aside. And uh, this is where I think it's, hugely important and I'm not sure if people will think about it. Many volleyball is three aside. There's no setters, there's no attackers, there's no nobody. Uh, I would sort of recommend that there's nobody at the net. The three people are always in the backcourt and it should be played with three. And it's three touches. It has to be three touches. If we've gone through a program of catch and throw and brought the kids up along and then bring them up to mini, vo mini volleyball and this, uh, this is the game that needs to have three touches. So the first ball comes over the net, somebody's going to pass it. Yep. There should be no setter. One of the other kids should be moving in and, and their thing to set this ball and another kid should be moving in to, to spike it or, or whatever like yeah uh, and uh, 
and this goes back to one of the original things like you know people when they're playing mini volleyball they will play it with four i would call that midi volleyball yeah sure in in mini volleyball like uh, you have people trying to say oh do you must have a setter there you must mm. have this like no so already here we're trying to impose things on kids that we shouldn't be like the kids should be there to enjoy themselves so, each, so in that then each kid, because there's no specific setter, each kid's learning all the skills for all, all positions, the skills basically. The game. Yeah. yeah, and they take it in turns to go around like, like who, when a kid is 10 or 12 or 13 can say, oh, that kid is going to be a great setter or that kid is going to be whatever it is. And we will come along to that again. Yeah. You know, but it's actually from here up, I think, where teams and coaches and clubs lose out. Uh, and um, like, I will come back to this if I have time at the end. Yeah. Because like I, I see other sports, like I see our own sport, but like I have grandkids and I went down one evening to watch one of my grandkids, he was seven. He was playing in an under eight competition. He was out in the field for 30 minutes. Mm. He didn't kick the ball once. Yeah. Like, that's not a sport for kids. In any court, in any sport, like, at this stage, kids should be getting, the more they touch the ball, the better. And again, as I said, like, starting off playing mini volleyball or two versus two, teams should play with each other so they can learn the skills under no pressure. So if I'm going to volley the ball over the net to you, it's going to you and you're going to have a good chance of playing the ball. So you get your skills like that playing together, see how long we can keep the rally going instead of seeing who can win the rally. Yeah. Yeah. And that way then kids get to, they get their skills going pretty well and when they have their skills going pretty well now you can play versus each other three against three uh, and as i say like this shouldn't be imposing uh, rules on kids at this stage like they're not mini adults i can't emphasize that enough like you know so so just to just to ask one that then just to dig into that a little bit so it's three and three to begin with until they have the adequate skills to then play three versus three. Is yeah. that kind of what you're saying? So yeah. what stage then do you kind of make that decision that, right, okay, you know, you may have a group of, say, 12, 12 kids, right? Six, they're, they're ready now to, to compete against each other, to play, to play a match and try and win a point. Those six maybe, maybe need to keep working on, on, on yeah. playing with each other. How do you make yeah, that court? You, can you, do is you have your good six, you, you push them up to this little court and you play three versus three with them. Okay. The other six or seven or eight kids, you're going to play three with three. So you just hold them back a little bit until the scales come good. The worst thing you can do is push them up, even though they might want to go. It's yeah. to keep you back and you can set targets for them like when you can keep that rally going five times over the net so you put it over the net you have three touches it goes back and when you can do that five six seven eight nine ten times then we, let's go up to the other one okay yeah so you can make challenges and targets at that like you know yeah like winning at this stage like uh, our Pumas team, if you're ever talking to them, we don't talk about winning, even mm -hmm. at all level. The girls will tell you, we don't talk about winning and losing. We talk about performing and how did we achieve our goals in that match today by doing whatever we wanted to do. So, like, particularly at this stage, there shouldn't be. Now, you will have other people like... Uh, Starting uh, talent identification. This is a great sort of 
catchphrase in, in all sports. Let's go out and identify our things like. Uh, in Ireland, I can safely say, because it's backed up by research, most sports in Ireland don't do talent identification. Mm. What they do is talent selection. So somebody, and, and this is not just volleyball, this is across the board. Uh, a coach comes down and he looks and he's looking for a particular thing for a particular he will pick what he believes are the best players. Not who's going to be the best players in 12 months time. Who's the best players there at that particular moment, which really means nothing in a player's development role. Uh, I've done a bit of research. I like Robbie. I've done a bit of research into Robbie and I was reading an article there on South African Robbie. And I believe the very same is true of Irish Robbie and uh, other things. And they looked at under 13s and looked at the individuals there and they discovered when they went back to look at under 18 Robbie, only 26% of the kids that were playing under 13 were still playing under 18 Robbie. Mm. Yeah. So that's a huge drop off. Yeah. And like most of that drop off is put down to pressure, whatever it is, Kids not enjoying it. And, uh, and this is so important at this level. You know, like at, at this level, like our training session, and uh, again, like this is just from experience and talking to people. Our training session for these kids, they're our leopards, we'll say, that's what we call them. When they come into the hall at six o'clock, Right, that's when training starts. Most of them are there at 20 to 6, part of the 6 anyway. So, like, they obviously must like it. Yeah. Coming early, like, you know. But up to 10 past, 10 past 6, we do nothing with them. We just let them run around the hall. And what you will see is groups of them get together and they sit down and have a chat and they get up and they run around and they do other things. Like that 10 minutes like that allows these kids to socialize, have a quick chat with each other, talk about things that's important to them. And then when we start training at 10 past six, these kids are ready to go. So, so your leopards, what, what age is your leopards then? What, what leopards groups are about 10, 11, 12, you know? Uh, so we we would allow them now would we allow others to do a do but slightly different but with young kids like that 10 minutes will probably be what will bring them back the following week sure like a lot of them the following week uh, so like that's talent identification we don't do it winning uh, warm-ups Again, like, you know, and I think if you watch our pumas, people will say our warm-ups are very structured and they're this and very regimental, and they are at that stage. But at this stage, under 13, warm-up should be fun. Doing something different, getting things to go, like, you know. Mm. And uh, that, like, and you'll see, like, the skills at this stage, like, uh, should people be worried about uh, spikes and all of that? Like, I would never worry about that. The three things I'd worry about would be serve, pass, folly, teamwork. And because um, kids, to me, are not capable at this stage, even though people will tell me I'm wrong, like there's a thing they call a drive in volleyball and that's where a kid stands on the floor and hits the ball with an overhand action. And they're the skills that 
I would be worried about, like, you know. Mm. The other thing that I, I think at this stage, like most kids that still be playing three sports at least. Yeah. And when we come back at the end, we're going to talk thing about coordination and we'll, um, we'll come back to that. That's a big, big problem. Now we come on to our train and to train program. And in this one, this is 12 to 16, 13 to 16, 17, whatever, like ages shouldn't matter that much. Yeah. Right. So at this stage now, kids are beginning to focus more. Yeah. They're, um, you can get their attention, they have greater self-awareness and they should, under, they should understand what responsibility is and what's expected of them. Now that grows with them. When they come into this at 12, they won't, but this is part of the thing that should be taught to them as they're going up along because they're able to take it. Uh, you will find at this stage that players become more competitive. Yeah, they want to play competitive games. Nothing wrong with that, yeah? But this is where a team spirit and common goals for the team should be brought in. And it's, again, at this stage, you'll probably see uh, a difference between girls' teams and boys' teams. Uh, like there's a there's a big differences with coaching men and women and when it's getting up around this level like men are very ego orientated it's how hard can i hit a ball like how hard was my spike like you know the team doesn't worry them too much it's me whereas mm. girls women i think they think more of community, the team, is how can we progress together? How can yeah. we do things? How can I help the team? You will never hear a lad saying that. It's how can the team help me to look better? You know? But like, that's just it. Like, so at this stage, the coach challenges. Yeah? The coach will be challenging the players and what they're able to do. Uh, it, like, and this shouldn't be teaching, this should be getting the kids to find out the answers to the challenge themselves. You know, like, uh, we don't want, ro well, I don't want robots on my team. Yeah. And I don't want people on my team, something goes wrong in the court, and they all look across at the bench to the coach, what am I going to do now? I don't like that. Yeah, so do you kind of then set problems for them to solve? Do you kind of try and structure drills so you, you, you know it's going to go wrong? So they have to kind of figure out a bit of kind of yeah, what they they call it, guided out. discovery, is it? Yeah, they have to figure it out themselves. How can we do this? How can we make this work? Uh, some people will tell you it's a waste of time doing that. Mm. I don't think so because, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I think when kids have to figure it out themselves and come up with the answer. Once they get it, they never lose it. If you tell them it's too easy and it's gone out of their head almost immediately. Yeah. Uh, like the game at this stage should be about performance. Like uh, just an idea like we will say, to, I will say to my youngsters at this level, like, you know, Right, what is like if we're going to play a game, like what's our goals for today? And we will talk about passing. We'll talk about serving. We might talk about we'll, we'll talk about all the different actions in the game. Mm. And our goal is going to be can we pass X amount of balls? It's not can we win the game, can we take a set? It's nothing like that. It's can we perform the way we should be able to perform by doing these skills properly, yeah? Sure. There's no teamwork going to be, like if a sub comes on or off, like they come in. 
the other thing at this stage I think that's hugely important is to give the kids responsibility. Uh, an example of that, and I'm sure there's a few of my kids listening in on this. Uh, last year we went to Portugal. We came home from Portugal and I said to the girls, right guys, from now on, <clears throat> you're going to take responsibility for lots of things. So you're going to start now, like how are we going to train next year? How often are we going to train? <clears throat> and little things like that. Now, the thing is, if, if you do this, and if the kids come up with something, you have to be prepared to go with it because you set it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, like, sorry, you know, Tom, sorry, go on. I'll, 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 I'll ask my question I'm thinking of in a minute. Go on. Sorry. Yeah. But you will be surprised at what the kids will do. Like, mm. for instance, to me, like the first thing that came back to me now, we train twice a week. Asha. First thing the kids came back and said to me is, right, Tom, we're going training three times a week. <laughs> that was it. Fair dues to them. I was absolutely thrilled. Yeah, that you were going to do that, but because that meant I had to be there, I mm. get in the responsibility of making out these things. Uh, you know, and uh, and why and why was that, Tom? Was it because that's what they seen in Portugal? What the clubs yeah, and teams yeah, in other countries were doing? Was, like you know, traveling abroad is is a great thing to broaden youngsters' minds and make them. Mm. See. Like probably some they should have mentioned, but this is probably a good time to mention it. Like, you know, uh, good coaches will tell you that you shouldn't coach the skills of volleyball to kids. You should coach them how to love the game. Mm. You should just coach them to love that game. And once you coach them to love the game they're playing, like, you have them hooked. Yeah. Uh, and why is that? Because when you go abroad, uh, when we were in Portugal and the girls were asking the other girls, how often do you train? And they get back oh, four or five times a week. Mm. And you know, what? You put that. And like the answer was like, but we love playing volleyball. Why wouldn't we? Yeah. Oh, and when you think of it, isn't it? Normal, no. If you love doing something, you'll go and do it. I don't yeah. think we coach that here in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Don't coach kids to love what they're doing. And this goes back along, as I was saying to you, when kids come in at the start, you make them enjoyment, fun, everything about the game. Yeah? And, like... Uh, this is the huge, this area here, like this is the most important uh, module of the thing for me, 12 to 16. Yeah. This is where coming to, like I reckon 14, 15, you can start to specialize with kids. Anything before that, and I think you're doing kids an injustice. As I said, this is my, I'm not saying it's right, this is my thing of it. Yeah, uh, we have found like that it works. Uh, the other thing at this stage, like usually kids when they get to the end of this phase, they will really have their mind made up as to what sport they'd like to specialize in. Hmm. Uh, it's also at this point and I, I think lots of people will disagree with this, but when you, when kids get to 16 or 17, and this is looking abroad, uh, if you want to play a sport at an elite level, even volleyball, and you're playing beach volleyball and you're playing indoor volleyball, when you get to the end of this phase, beach volleyball and indoor volleyball don't mix. I'm, I'm talking about elite level. Yeah, yeah, sure. You will usually find that people 
In fact, uh, last Thursday night, was it, Andre was, uh, had an interview with a, a young Romanian girl, 19. It's exactly what came into my head when you said, yeah, and, and she at that age made that choice, even though she loved she both sports, choice. yeah. And you will usually find that people that want to go on to really elite stuff will have to make that choice. Now, if they have to make that choice, then like obviously other kids really, if they want to be really good players, they're going to have to make a choice. Is it going to be gas, soccer, basketball, volleyball or something else? And it's mm. around this period that uh, these choices are made. Yeah. Now, uh, now, we all know that volleyball is a late specialization sport. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, if, if kids are taught the proper fundamental basics of movement and everything else, uh, right up to now and even later, kids can cross over to different sports. If they haven't learned their ABCs and their other stuff, they will find it very hard to do so. Yeah, I remember a couple of weeks ago we had Oshie McArdle on, and he was saying he only really took up volleyball. I think he was 16, 17, yep. went into school, and because he had, and he grew up in Belgium, which we might talk about in a little while, because they have a really strong kind of focus on developing fundamental movement skills. But I think because he grew up there, he had then the physical literacy in his locker. So you can transition to, to a completely new spot because you can learn the skills quickly. That's where the fundamentals are so important. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you learn those, you can crisscross late specialization sports. Yeah. And then our training to compete program 16 to 23. This is where things get serious. Yeah. The player is going to specialise, the coach is going to facilitate the player on what they want to do and help them. And the game is all about performance. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and like, what more can I say about that? That like mm. training is going to become huge. There's going to be huge competition. Uh, knowledge, maturity, mental training, nutrition. Now, all these would have been touched on. But when you yeah. get to this stage now, they become important. Yeah. So it's a lot of the little things, what people call the little things, become big things. You know, your nutrition, your sleep patterns, your time management, all these are going to come into this, like, you know, uh, the coach facilitates players. How does that, like he advises them, like there should be time management, your nutrition. We're going to facilitate your training on, because you're going to be an outside hitter. This is going to be a different type of training. This is where not everybody's going to be doing the same things. Not saying they were doing the same, but they're really going to be divided at this stage. Yeah. And this is up to the coach to facilitate all these different things that players have to do with. And as I said, the game is about performance. Uh, other coaches would say the game is about winning. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I would, I'm not, it's not that much against it, but uh, people have to understand when you go into a competition, like if we start out a competition with 12 teams, only one team can win. Yeah. Does that mean if you don't win, you're a loser? I don't think so. You mm. know, uh, I don't think anybody that takes up sport and makes an effort to play it or will, will ever be a loser. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but winning automatically try to push people into places and I, I just don't like it, you know. Like to me, um, you, you have to teach people to just play the game. And if you play your best, you increase your chances of coming out on top. 
if you play your best and if the other team wallops you, then fair dues, they were a better team on the day. That's not yeah, yeah, yeah. about it. But the issue is for you to play your best. And like for me at this stage, I would say, even if we're going up against a far better team, I would always say to the girls, if we play our best, and if they're complacent and they don't play their best, then that might even the competition a bit. Yeah. So uh, one of our things would be always to go out and play as well as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Now, after that, you're getting into like professional, mm. which we probably shouldn't really go into. Yeah. Yeah. It's, if I can make it like now, that's the long term athlete development. Lots yeah. of good stuff in it. To me, there's some stuff they missed in it, and that's not so good. Right. I just like that to come through this if I could, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll go with first of all, like, uh, I would say. The, the, the models or the, the modules are not very realistic to us in many cases. Like, for example, within long-term athlete development, you'll hear a whole lot of talk about PHV and PH this and PH that, and this is the optimal time for doing certain things. And I would say to coaches, like, do you really know what PHV is? Mm -hmm. You really want to know if you want to take up coaching seriously, maybe you should know. You know, people will tell you, for example, that um, speed is best trained before PHV and that strength is best trained after it. Uh, my own personal, I don't think that's true. And because somebody doesn't do strength training at a particular time, doesn't mean they lose out. I yeah, don't. just uh, just for people watching, um, I suppose so what you're referring to is the body develops in different stages, and there's yeah. certain optimal times to develop well, certain yeah. physical. Yeah, well, that's what they say. Yeah, now, there, there may be optimal times, but, but because you don't fit into this window, and you're going to do it a little bit here, like to me, I don't think you're you're going to lose out. Mm. You know, I think you can still stay within it. Yeah, yeah. And sure. the, the, the other thing, like that, when you go through the long-term athlete development, like it's like as if they're uh, teaching robots. There's one, two. And you put into your little slots and you go along. I'm not terribly keen on that. Like you know, I don't think kids are robots. Mm. You know and. Uh, like playing volleyball is not a science experiment. To me, it's not. And I don't think we need a uh, huge module that's going to put kids into slots and say, if you don't do this in that slot, then you can't do something else, like, you know? Uh, and I don't think we need a whole lot of models about this. Like, to me, mm. what we need is coaches, good coaches. And they'll overcome most of it. The, the other thing that I say is passion. You'll never hear the word passion mentioned in long-term athlete development. No, but seriously, you won't. Yeah, yeah. No. And like that's what the game is about. That's what any game is about. Passion. You know, it's it's um and if if, if young kids are not enjoying a sport, the likelihood is they'll never have a, a passion to excel in that sport. Yeah. You know, and at some point, and that some point is around 16, 15 or 16, the kid themselves are going to have to make a decision. Mm. Not the coach. Like, I might want one of my kids really badly to go on and do something, but it's not up to me. It's not up to their parents. Like that kid needs to want it themselves to go and do yeah. it. Yeah. Like so much, so much comes back to 
well, well, not even somewhat, everything comes back to enjoyment. You know, yeah. whether you're a player, a coach, or a referee, you, you, yeah. know, it's, it's, you, you do what you enjoy. And, and, and again, if you go back to Andre and that youngster he was interviewing, and the question was asked, like, uh, when is she happy? And the answer was, when I'm on the volleyball court. Yeah, yeah. That's a passion. Yeah. No. Now, like, uh, parents can be a problem. Yeah. Uh, parents, some parents will push the kids too. Some parents won't push them. And this is where I think coaches and parents need to work together for the good of the child. Mm. Yeah. And whether people like it or not, like, uh, and parents have told me this themselves, that coaches of youths have a huge, huge impact on kids. Yeah. Yeah. Kids will go home and tell their mammies and daddies, oh, Tom told me this and Tom told me that. And if Tom said it, it must be right. Yeah. And I'm not just saying me, any coach. So I think coaches need to be very careful about the way they teach kids and what they say to them, because kids will really look up to them. Yeah. Go by what those coaches say. So coaches have a huge, huge responsibility. Yeah. We have a couple of questions coming in here, Tom. I'm just going to... Um... Right. Pop them out to you here. Um, so Annie is asking, and, and this is something we actually chatted about early before we went live. Um, she's asking about the iCoach Kids Seminar last summer. Um, and uh, that was an event held. It's, a, it's an EU, it's a European um, project, isn't it? But it was held in Limerick down in Uella, um, which was a big coup for Ireland, kind of bringing that event here. Um, uh, and at the conference, they talked about players planning sessions and what they want to do for sessions. Um, so I suppose the question is kind of how important is that that players can take ownership of of their own learning and of their own development and training? Or speak. Like, uh, like me speak. The, um, I coach kids conference, the ICK conference. Like, I think everybody, every coach, should be forced to go on one of them. It should be mandatory. Sure. You know, like that's just me because you can learn so much down there. Like, you know, like for instance, I, I know we mentioned it before and we're on about coaching now, like, and people will say like, what's the right way to do this? And what's the right way to do that? Like I, I said it to you earlier, we have the world's best coaches in Ireland. All people have to do is look around and see it, you know, mm. like the mammies and daddies of babies, like, like a baby has to learn, like even to roll over on the thing and starts crying. Parent will go over, roll the kid back, they roll over again, they cry, they roll them back. And this is what they'll do. And they won't suddenly stand there and start shouting at the kid and saying like, you know, you were told not to do that. You were told not to do this. They'll yeah. do it. When the kid starts crawling and they fall over and mammy's going to pick him up again and set him upright and they're going to do this. And the same when they're walking. Yeah. You'll, you'll never hear a mother or father saying to the kid, right, you put your right foot out first and then you put your left foot and then you put your right foot kids yeah. don't learn like that like you know and as I say like the patience that those parents have that's what coaching is all about that's coaching at a young age and like people could learn a huge amount of lessons off of that like and I think yeah. they should you know and I think a, a great big thank you and well done should go out to all the parents for the showing coaches what they should do. I suppose it's something I was going to mention earlier, but you're on a bit of a roll, so I didn't want to stop you. It, <laughs> seems, it seems like the theme, the theme of all the things you're talking about, and look, it's obviously the theme because the title is long-term player development, but the importance of when you get that group in for the first time or the first few times, it's not necessarily about what you can achieve 
in an hour or a week or a season. It's about what you can achieve when that kid is 18, 19, 20 years old. And yeah. having patience, I suppose. Yeah. Was an, um, um, systemic approach rather than um, the short-term gains. But like, do, do we have like, again, I'll use the Pume as, as an example, like all of those are still 16. Mm. I think they're pretty good volleyball players. Yeah, like, can you think what another 10 years would do for them with the right culture? Yeah. They'll still only be coming into their prime. Mm. Now we're talking about having real volleyball in Ireland. Like if we have kids 13, 14, that's learning volleyball. If we have the patience and decent coaching, like in, in 10 years time, Ireland should be looking to be playing in the European zonal competitions or category B competitions or going on to do that, like, you know. Yeah, I think we should be. Have, have we all seized up? We have. Hello, Gary. Hi, sorry, Tom. I think I lost you there for a second. No, but like, you know, in, 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 if, if we were to sit down and look at it and not worry about what happens next year or the year after, what's yeah. going to happen in 10 years? Now we're talking volleyball, like, you know. So tell us a little bit about the Pumas then. So... That team, um, when we're, so it's it's a, you'd have Sophie and I'm just trying to you know the people that are watching just to kind of may recognise through the names you have Sophie, uh, Kira, um, Fran, um, Emma. They would be all so they're all 15, 16 now. When did they start coming to to, to Newbridge? How old would they have been? Like most of them started in primary school. Okay. Right. Like now the thing about those kids is. Like at underage competition, they've never lost a game. Mm. Right? They've never dropped a set. Right. And I'm sure they thought they were the bee's knees. There's no doubt until we went to Portugal. Yeah. And and they got the arse to spit off themselves. Out, <laughs> you know. And like the girls will say that to you, you know, and they are all good, but like they're good and they deserve to be told that they're good because they've put in the work, mm. you know, uh, and, you know, any child that puts in the effort, like, deserves, like, praise is a great thing with kids. Yeah. You know, like, instead of giving out the whole time to kids, and I'm sure most people know about that, like, we would usually try... You should never try and catch a kid doing something wrong. Yeah, sure. Always catch the kid doing something right. Yeah. So yeah. You can just give him the thumbs up or the nod or the wink. It needn't be anything special. The other thing that people, coaches, I said, just need to understand is that social life is very important to youngsters. And there has to be time for kids to socialize. Coaches need to understand this. Mm. So like usually when a kid is coming around that age group, obviously they have their families, they have their education, they have their sport and they have their social life. You know, uh, and like they have to be allowed to socialize. Yeah. Uh, social you can't give up your social life just to do more training or to train extra or to do something else there has to be a, a balance between everything that people do yeah sure yeah. like in in my time and what i coach is that if kids want to be really serious about volleyball they have three things in life Family is number one, yeah? Education or job is number two, because if you want to play volleyball in Ireland, you better have money <laughs> yeah, to pay for it. No, seriously, like, you know, and then their sport should be number three. Mm. So they would be the three priorities I would talk to the kids about. 
and uh, as I said, parent support. And the, the last thing, Gary, because we're going on coordination. Mm. Uh, when we go back to the 10, 12 year olds, uh, if Volleyball Ireland decides to do everything right by the 10, 9, 10, 11 year olds, you know, and we're not going to push them. But these same kids are going to soccer or basketball or whatever it is. And if they're organizing competitions, we have our under eight competition, we have our under 10, and we have this, then like volleyball is going to be at a disadvantage because we will lose kids because there's competition down here. Yeah, if you can understand what I'm saying. So kids will sometimes want to go where the competition is. And yeah. this is where there should be a coordination between all sports that up to the age of 11 or 12, nobody's pushed in any direction. Mm. Now, what's the chances of that happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be an easy one solved overnight. Yeah, but that's what should happen. Mm. Now, that's more or less, I've gone on too long again, haven't I? Not quite, not quite. Well, it's interesting though, like, it's, I know what you're saying there about the 9, 10 and 11 roads, but I'm thinking even before that really in terms of the fundamental stage. Oh, like, yeah. It should be from 6 to 8, the kid going to the, you know, why, why don't why don't we have a national approach to all sports in that, you know, in January, March, and April, if they're at the, the rugby club, whatever, you know, they're doing this fundamentals program, and they then go into the cricket club or the hockey club in summer, they're doing this fundamentals program. It's all fundamentals, you know. Yeah, or you it know. is like, you know, but like it's, 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 some things can head it, like if there's people listening to have to want to know it, like within mm. our club, youngsters right right up to the pumas uh, coaches are not allowed to shout at the kids yeah when you're coaching there's no shouting mm. that's it out the door uh we don't use whistles i never like using a whistle coaching uh to me uh, whistling at somebody like that's like when you're out sheep herding and you have a dog and you whistle for them like you know shouldn't if a coach yeah. can't manage kids without reverting to something like that anytime we take out a whistle in the club the kids say game because that's the only time to see a whistle yeah yeah, yeah you sure. know? so the small things like that that can help kids to yeah. read and be themselves and you know coaches like the, the other thing I'd like to say on this, like, because it annoys me at times, is that like you go to school competitions, but underage competitions in particular, whatever, and the referee blows for a fault, a handling error or something else. And you have somebody saying, oh, like the referees are very strict. Like, you know, Jake, why did you blow that? Like they're only learning. Now, mm. to me, like there's one set of rules if you want to play a thing, you play to that rules. If you want to make another game, then you make up another set of rules and you call it that. Mm. The other thing I'd like to say about that, like, is that if, um, and even my kids will tell you this, if, if somebody's out in court and they can't pass a ball or they can't volley a ball, that is not the player's fault. That's the coach's fault. It's the coach's job to teach those kids how to pass, how to volley, how to spike, whatever it is. Hmm. And no coach should ever shout at a kid because they didn't volley or they didn't pass the ball the way they should have. Because yeah. that is, that's coach's job yeah. to teach yeah. those kids. Just before we wrap up, um, I suppose one of the success... Uh, one of the reasons why Newbridge has been so successful in developing uh, all these players, I suppose, is the, the close link with the school. Um, it's almost it's almost one in a way. I'm kind of wondering if you maybe just talk about how that link works. Just so if there's any other club coaches or anyone from clubs watching, just to explain how the, the relationship with Newbridge and Holy Family works so they can maybe replicate that or take yeah. some learning. 
well like yeah yes we we can do that but like um the holy family wouldn't be successful unless volleyball was started in the primary school so right. the thing is like how do you get volleyball started in the primary school and the way we do it is and it's not that somebody has loads of time uh in third fourth fifth class in primary schools uh when we go in there we don't teach them volleyball mm. we don't teach them anything even like volleyball and our mission and again the kids that do it in transition year will tell you their challenge is to make their lessons so enjoyable that the kids want to come back for more it doesn't make a difference it, it doesn't have to be volleyball they're doing there can be a ball involved in it but the whole idea is to make that session so enjoyable for the kids like if they do handstands the whole time around i don't mind what they do as yeah. long as the kids are enjoying it so much they want to come back and then eventually like and again if you were talking to sophie that she done it and suddenly kids will start ask, like, is there a volleyball club? Do you play volleyball club? Can I join your volleyball club? And why do they do it? It's not because of volleyball. Mm. It's because they believe like volleyball is a brilliant sport. If this is what they do in volleyball, it must be brilliant. So when we get them into the club, we will still do the same thing, slowly wean them off it and get them into playing volleyball. Like Annie would tell you, like we have a sort of a system. We said you the first 10 minutes is a chat, and then then we do a warm-up for 20 minutes, which is games, and then we do our challenges, our circuits, which is ladders and everything. Yeah. And then we do 20 minutes of volleyball. And that, yeah. that thing gets the kids ready for going into the, the holy family. Hmm. Uh, now I coach the kids in the holy family once a week. Is that good enough to make them win things? The answer is no. If, if people were to sit and look and study school volleyball, you will find that where volleyball is good in schools, there's a club close by. Mm. Uh, like 90 minutes a week is not going to teach kids how to play volleyball. Yeah. Three hours will. Yeah. You know, now the schools can be hunting ground. And again, if you make, if I make sessions in the Holy Family enjoyable for people, then we'll get more people even there to come to the club. Yeah, sure. Now, the problem we have there and the problem all coaches will have <clears throat> is that at 12, 13, you know, up around that thing, they need to have learned their ABCs. Yeah. And that ABCs would would be usually learned in primary school or at the latest, the first year in secondary school. Now, yeah. it doesn't have to be learned with volleyball. It can be learned with anything. Yeah, sure. Oh, and sorry, like you put up the last thing, active for life. Now, everybody knows what that is. But can I throw something into that? Course, I just popped up the ages there because I know we were discussing earlier, just roughly, if they're wrong, they're kind of roughly at the right kind of zones. I know we possibly could have had them up earlier, but yeah, go on, it's for life. Ages, ages shouldn't matter too much because there's always going to be a year or two here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The active for life, like uh, I would say the active for life should start in the 9 to 12 age group. Okay. Right, so like, and again, this is only a thought of mine. Hmm. When, you see, when you're watching kids and you can see kids and they're training there and we talk about talent identification and you're saying to yourself, for one reason or the other, <clears throat> that a kid is not going to make a brilliant volleyball player or a brilliant basketball player or whatever it is. Like the coach should try and because you usually find that kid 
is in the club because they like it, their friends are there, whatever reason that we discussed. Yeah. If that kid was sort of guided by the coach, maybe towards officiating, maybe towards something else, knowing like, you know, like um, you're going to send her or him on the referee's course that comes up, even though she's still only 12, let it be a school, mm. school let it be something else. But I think we lose too many kids around that time because they suddenly find, oh, the team doesn't want me. I'm not good enough for that. And I think it should be the coach's job to say, like, well, that kid like being here yeah. with their friends. There must be a job there in the future for them. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can we start making that job now? Okay. Right. Uh, well, look, listen, we've had you for uh, well over an hour now, so I'm kind of conscious that it's getting dark there in Newbridge. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of uh, want to let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Kind of just before we finish, any other kind of bits of advice, I suppose? Um, one of the main things I've got from this is the importance of getting physical literacy right and getting fundamentals and the ABCs right. Oh, well, yeah, that's huge. The frame of, you know, you giving advice now to a club coach or a school teacher out there on the importance of fundamental movement skills. What what advice would you what advice would you give? I I I would say like if if people are really serious about coaching, and if there's a young coach starting off, or maybe a, a, somebody is coaching for a few years but decide right, I want to go a little bit further. Mm. I would say. Uh, Go and coach kids for 12 months. Yeah. Right. Uh, several reasons why, like, uh, you need to be a very good communicator to get your point across to kids. Uh, you need to have a lot of patience. Yeah. You need to come up with ideas, not only how to keep the kids active, but to keep them under control and how do you control them without screaming and shouting and jumping up and down? And I think kids can teach you so much. And <clears throat> I don't think coaches realize it until they actually do it. Mm. And the other thing that coaching kids does like for you is that <clears throat> when you see a kid that started, well, to me, like this is my buzz. Kids come in, as I said, they can't catch, they can't run properly, they can't throw a ball. And 12 months later, you see these kids going around, digging the ball up in the air and running after it and catching it and doing all the things that you shouldn't. Like, to me, that should give anybody, like, look yeah. what's happened to that kid in 12 months. Yeah. Coaching is unique, isn't it, in that it can you can really have a, a positive impact on somebody's life for the rest of their life. Um, and there's not many things that, you know, that's one of the beauties of sport and one of the great gifts of sport, um, but you can have the opportunity to, to, to leave a positive impact on, on a child. Oh, well, hugely so. And again, as I said earlier, this is where coaches need to be so careful. Yeah. And, and, and they need to make sure they're doing the right thing by the kid, that they're mm. not doing it for themselves. Sure, sure. Oh, and bring the kids on. And if you have some kids that can do something in or that in 10 years' time and look back and say, God, like I, I like Tom told me that, or Tom told me this, and I was then like that's reward. You might never hear it, but that, that's a coach's reward. Yeah. Well, look, on that note, um, we'll wish you. A good night, Tom. Thank you very much for your time, your insights, um, and very interesting. Something, you know, the whole the, the process of having this long-term plan for developing players is something that I think, you know, it does get overlooked, um, and the importance of it is, is absolutely vital. So thanks again for your time this evening. Um, hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, and, yeah, until next time. Lovely, Gary. Thank you for having me, and whoever is still there listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, yeah, Gary. Thanks. See you later. Okay. Talk to you. Bye-bye yeah, now. Right.